So welcome to the March session of our fourth annual Religions and Practice of Peace Colloquium series. So I'm David Hempton, the Dean of the Divinity School, and thanks to all of you for being uh, with us tonight. Those of you joining us for the first time, uh, members of our cross-disciplinary RPP working group and Sustainable Peace Working Group, and colleagues and friends from right across Harvard and the local area, you're all very welcome. Special welcome to our guest speaker, the Reverend Dr. Ray Hammond, uh, for making uh, time to be with us tonight, and our moderator, Professor Stephanie Paulsell, and the Office of Ministry Studies at the Divinity School, which is co-sponsoring uh, tonight's session. So anybody here from Ministry Studies, thank you very much. Kerry, thank you. Um, now, we'd also like to express our gratitude to RPP's uh, generous supporters, including the Reverend Karen Vickers Budney and Al Budney for helping make these and other RPP activities possible. We're really grateful to all those who help in that way. And uh, to our RPP staff and graduate assistants for all their work and organizing this event. Thank you, everyone, uh, for doing that. <clears throat> the theme of our RPP colloquium series this year, as many of you know, is envisioning sustainable peace, leadership, collaboration, and creativity for a more humane and harmonious world. To help inform our emerging university-wide sustainable peace initiative, we've been inviting scholars, practitioners, and religious leaders to share their expertise on various facets of this highly complex topic with us, many of them from around the country and uh, from different parts of the world. Yet we are especially excited when we have an opportunity to hear from a local leader who has been making major contributions to the well-being and peace of people in our community right here in the Boston area itself. So tonight we are honored and delighted to have with us one of Boston's most outstanding and distinguished leaders who has been deeply involved for decades in serving the community as a medical doctor, a religious leader, and a foremost figure in Boston's uh, work to reduce violence and improve the lives of proven risk youth. We're fortunate to be able to count um, Reverend Dr. Hammond as part of our uh, Harvard Divinity School family. Um, as uh, an alum of Harvard University, as the husband of the Divinity School Swartz's resident practitioner in ministry studies, his partner in peace, Reverend Dr. Gloria White Hammond, who will be here shortly. Um, among the most uh, crucial and challenging aspects of sustainable peace efforts in virtually any context are building coalitions across non-traditional lines, engaging people at the margins, and supporting proven risk populations, especially our youth. So we're uh, truly grateful to um, uh, Ray Hammond for taking the time to share his wisdom in these areas with us, as well as to offer his insights into the spiritual dimension resources involved based on decades of uh, multifaceted work. So moderating tonight's session will be our very own Professor Stephanie Paulsell, the Susan Shawcross Swartz Professor of the Practice of Christian Studies here at the Divinity School. She is the author of Honoring the Body, Meditations on a Christian Practice, and co-author with uh, Harvey Cox of Lamentations and the Song of Songs, a Theological Biblical Commentary. Great commentary. She is also the editor of and contributor to The Scope of Our Art, The Vocation of the Theological Educator, and has a new book coming out next year on religion around Virginia Woolf. She is an ordained minister in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and a regular columnist for the journal The Christian Century. I'm sure many of you have read her um, uh, essays in that. Her current project is a volume of essays on the religious and moral vision of the novelist Toni Morrison, edited with our own David Carrasco and Mara Willard. So it's a great pleasure, Stephanie, to have you with us, and thanks for moderating tonight's session. Over pleasure. to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight and to get to hear Reverend Ray Hammond. Um, this is a really important conversation and we're really grateful to all of you for coming out for it. Reverend Ray Hammond was born and raised in Philadelphia, the eldest son of a Baptist preacher and a school teacher. He was educated in the Philadelphia public schools 
and went on to graduate from Harvard College and Harvard Medical School. He completed his surgical residency at the New England Deaconess Hospital in Boston and joined the emergency medicine staff at Cape Cod Hospital in Hyannis, where he worked for many years. Pastor Hammond accepted the call to the preaching ministry in 1976 and completed his Master of Arts degree in the study of religion in Christian and medical ethics at the Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences in 1982. In 1988, he was called to be the founder and pastor of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Boston. Now, I know there are some people here tonight from Bethel. Um, and Bethel, uh, if you do not know this church, is an extraordinary community um, in Boston. It is leading the way and has led the way on issues ranging from sexual and gender-based violence to planning for the end of life and end of life care, from interreligious dialogue that takes place in lots of different ways and forms at Bethel. Um, to the protection and accompaniment of immigrants and refugees. Um, in all these issues, they have been showing us the way for a long time. Bethel is also a church that makes ministers, and we have um, benefited from that here at HDS. Um, Ray and Gloria have sent us some of our finest students. Um, I'll just mention too, Liz Walker, who was a journalist here in um, New England, the first African-American woman to anchor um, a, a local news program in New England, who was called to ministry in the pews of Bethel AME, um, came here to do her MDiv and now pastors Roxbury Presbyterian Church and is, like Ray, a leader um, in Boston. Um, and also Arle Prello, um, who was just recently on campus, a fantastic documentary filmmaker who is finishing now a film on the great uh, theologian and philosopher of the civil rights movement, Howard Thurman. Um, so I could keep going listing names of people Ray and Gloria have sent us over the years, but I think a church that inspires people to change their lives and become ministers um, is a really amazing church. Pastor Hammond is chairman and co-founder of the Ten Point Coalition, about which we will hear tonight, an ecumenical group of Christian clergy and lay leaders who are working to mobilize the greater Boston community around issues affecting proven risk youth. He is chair of Bethel's Generation Excel program. He is the executive committee member of the Black Ministerial Alliance. He's chair of the Boston Opportunity Agenda, a member of the strategy team of the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, a member of the Boston Green Ribbon Commission, and a trustee of the Yawkey Foundation, the Gardner Museum, the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, and the Math and Technology Charter High School. He's a former chairman of the Boston Foundation, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is the recipient of numerous honors and honorary doctorates from all over. As you can hear from that long list, um, Ray Hammond is uniquely qualified to speak to us about the power of partnership in ministry um, because he has spent his career trying to knit the cultural, religious, and political institutions and resources of Boston together and marshalling the creative energy at those intersections for those who have been pushed to the margins of our civic society. Um, and so we're looking forward very much to hearing about how he has done that tonight and how we might participate in this work. He is the proud husband of the Reverend Dr. Gloria White Hammond, a pediatrician and co-pastor to whom he has been married since 1973 and who is serving as our Swartz practitioner in residence here at HDS and is down the hall for me and I'm feeling very lucky about that. Um, he is the blessed father of two daughters, Mariama and Adia, and a son-in-law, Turin Dorsey, and the proud grandfather of Ella. He says that he counts as his greatest blessing the love of a God who made it possible for him to accomplish and receive more than he could have ever thought or asked. I would add to that that Ray has been very faithful to that love. Ray is a person who prays. And when I think of Ray, I think of something Howard Thurman said about the power of prayer in shaping a person's life. Um, he says, prayer can create a climate 
in which a person's life moves and functions. Indeed, it may become a way of living for the individual. It is ever possible that the time may come when a person carries around such an atmosphere with him and gives its quality to all that he does and communicates its spirit to all who cross his path. Um, that reminds me very much of Ray Hammond, who carries around an atmosphere of love, compassion, and care, um, and shares it with everyone he encounters. His talk to us tonight is entitled, Ministry to the Marginal, The Power of Partnerships. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Ray Hammond. Thank you all very much for uh, being here on a crisp New England uh, <laughs> evening. Um, we're about to face a terrible storm tomorrow, <laughs> but uh, we're, we've got uh, reasonable conditions here, and I'm so grateful for the time that you've spent and the opportunity for us to talk a little bit together. I see a number of friends spread throughout the audience, so I'm not going to start calling names before I get in trouble, <laughs> um, but I am so grateful for your presence here. And my deep thanks to uh, Dean Hempton, uh, to my good friend Stephanie Paulsell, to the, um, uh, the Sustainable Peace Initiative, which I uh, when it was first described to me by the dean, was wonderful, just uh, an exciting uh, idea, one that we've, as we'll talk about a little bit here, uh, have been trying to understand, engage with, um, trying to understand what we could learn from other uh, global initiatives around peace and how we could apply it, and were there any lessons in what we had experienced here and learned to be shared elsewhere. So we'll try to sort of explore all of that a little bit tonight. Um, I do want to begin by um, just giving you a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I am from, uh, born and raised in Philadelphia, the father of a uh, church planter mm -hmm. and a, a mother who was a public school teacher. Both of them the first people in their families to ever go to college. And uh, they be gave us a tremendous bequest, both in terms of a, a love for learning, but also a sense of the power of faith. Mm -hmm. um, we, I'm also part of that uh, generation that Stephen Carter has called the civil rights babies. And we were the folks who, uh, in some cases, probably if we were in the South, we may have actually been part uh, of the Civil Rights Movement, but most of us were not. We saw it, uh, we felt it, we knew its impact and its import, and in many ways, we were the direct beneficiaries of it. And so I think for myself and for many others, there was both a, a deep sense of an incredible opportunity that had been given to us and a deep sense of obligation that said, uh, the things that you can think about and dream of, the things that you can imagine and participate in, were bought with other people's blood, sweat, and tears. Mm -hmm. uh, people who would never, in many cases, experience those wonderful opportunities themselves. So you've got to ask yourself, how are you going to pay that back, and how are you going to pay it forward? Well, this is part of uh, what uh, was the process for me, and I want to share with you a. Um, what became not just a, a, a program, a coalition, an organization of which I was a part, but a really radical change in the understanding of my own calling and what ministry was all about. And I'm so grateful for some of the people here. Why don't you just raise your hands, all the Bethelites who have uh, been part of the process over these 30 years of trying to make uh, that understanding of calling a reality. So tonight we're talking about um, the, the Ten Point Coalition, but the real focus here is that is a kind of case study for ministry, what we call ministry to the marginal, those who are sort of pushed to the edges of society, uh, and to understand that if you're serious about uh, substantive change there and sustained change, you've got to be talking about partnership. My mantra is no single individual or organization makes a substantive or sustained change in anything. If you're talking about substance and sustaining, you're talking about partnership. That said, um, I want to share with you some, some interesting uh, comments from uh, uh, Steven Pinker. Some of you may know Steven. He's uh, here on campus. I, I think he's a little bit notorious for his <laughs> uh, somewhat anti-religious views, but I, I, we have great conversations. I, I really appreciate him. Uh, and um, um, to my utter amazement, he actually kind of gave us a shout out, and I'll share with you a little bit here. Um, some of you may be aware of the fact that he's advanced a thesis, and some people have really taken great issue with it, but I think many have said that there's, there's great substance here, and I think that's for real. Violence has declined over long stretches of time, and today we may be living in the most peaceable era in our species' existence. 
Now that's where I think many people sort of counterintuitive. Um, <laughs> we are um, convinced that as we look around uh, the, 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 the toll in terms of war and terror and so on, uh, that, that things must be incredibly violent, much more violent than they've ever been. His argument, and he's not alone in this, is that uh, our problem isn't that violence has gone up, it's that we are aware of it in real time from every imaginable corner of the globe. Um, and that, in fact, if you look back at the data that's available, we may well be in, again, as he's argued here, one of the most peaceable eras in our species existence. Like all good academics, and he's absolutely right, I think, to do this, uh, he then traces this uh, to six trends, five inner demons, four better angels, five historical forces, um, and one of those uh, uh, processes he goes on to call the pacification process, the civilizing process, the humanitarian revolution, the long peace, the new peace, and the rights revolution. Now, uh, I, I, what I appreciate is, I think he's on the mark when he says this is a very complex process that we've looked at, but in the civilizing process, he goes on to write this, and I'll just read this, one of the most impressive civilizing offenses of the 1990s came from African-American communities who set themselves the task of re-civilizing their young men. As with the pacifying of the American West a century before, much of the moral energy came from women and the church. In Boston, a team of clergymen led by uh, Ray Hammond, Eugene Rivers, Jeffrey Brown, and Sam Wood worked in partnership with the police and social service agencies to clamp down on gang violence. They leveraged the knowledge of local communities to identify the most dangerous gang members and put them on notice that the police and community were watching them, sometimes in meetings with their gangs, sometimes in meetings with their mothers and grandmothers. Community leaders also disrupted cycles of revenge by converging on any gang member who had recently been aggrieved and leaning on him to forswear vengeance. Now, Tulsi, but I, I appreciate the shout out, but doesn't quite explain what happened. The process wasn't so much re-civilizing young men as reconnecting with a generation of young men who in many instances we had intentionally or inadvertently abandoned. And coming back to say, we've got to work together. The second thing is uh, it doesn't make clear enough, and, and you'll see in so many of the reports at that time when people were just entranced by the notion of these people in collars walking around on city streets. But the real story is that this could not have been pulled off without extraordinary energy on the part of lay people uh, who really wanted to reclaim their neighborhoods and make a difference for generations to come. So mindful of that, um, let's talk about a little bit of what those times were like, um, where we've come from. Uh, these, uh, the story here begins in the 1980s with the growing problem of gun violence that was fueled by the drugs, especially the cocaine and crack trade. Um, in 1989, um, this was uh, sort of brought to a head by the death of a nine-year-old uh, wo young woman by the name of Tiffany Moore. The really sad piece of Tiffany's story was that her mother, to protect her from the growing gang violence, and this is literally blocks from where I live, uh, had sent her south. She brought her home just for two weeks to be able to spend time with her child, and in that two-week window, while standing at a post box, she was caught in the crossfire between two gangs and killed. They also have the Carol Stewart case in 1989, and I don't know many, how many of you have been around Boston since that time, uh, but this was a pivotal moment for the city. This involved a young white couple who were having their birthing classes at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, the police then got a report uh, from the husband that, his that they had been carjacked, that his wife had been shot, he had been shot, and he went on to describe the assailant as a black man in his 20s or late 20s or 30s. Uh, the husband underwent surgery and survived. The wife and child died. At that point, um, the police were called in and they ended up turning upside down the community in which this had occurred called Mission Hill. Subsequently, um, the, someone was identified by the name of Willie Bennett. Willie's mother's house was ransacked. All of Willie's associates were shaken down. Um, and all of this was kind of going on as people were getting both angry um, but also concerned because there wasn't the evidence that was really showing that Willie was the, um, the perpetrator in this case. Well, as it turned out, thankfully, there were a few detectives who do what you're supposed to do. 
When a wife turns up dead, the first suspect until cleared is? The husband. The husband. They followed uh, Homicide Forensics 101 and looked into the husband and they found the insurance policy and found the girlfriend and found the whole thing. Uh, one step, uh, the husband was one step ahead of them. He proceeded to jump off of the Tobin Bridge and uh, left a note. As tragic as this case was, um, what came out of it was a sense of just how bankrupt the approach of the police, the Boston Police Department, which had largely acted as an occupying army in communities of color. And that really opened the door for the beginning of a new way of thinking, at least the possibility of a new way of thinking about how policing should be done. And this is coming just as the whole notion of community policing is really beginning to rise across the nation. And some of the early proponents of it, William Bratton, uh, who came to Boston from the New York Transit Police, and followed by him, Paul Evans, who was actually homegrown, grew up in South Boston, um, but who said uh, the night of Carol Stewart's death, he remembered saying unto himself, the mayor has just called in every available detective to work on this case. I know for a fact that just hours before that, a black man was killed on Washington Street in Roxbury, and nobody called an extra detective in for his case. And that's when he began, as he said, to really see how clearly the differential was in terms of how the police department um, exercised its uh, mission on behalf of different communities. And he made up his mind he was going to be different and went on to become our commissioner and one of the major proponents of community policing. Another part of the timeline and the context for that time was a program called Stop and Search in 1989, an attempt to address the growing uh, uh, violence uh, by essentially giving the police the, the right to stop and search anyone whom they considered suspicious. Uh, completely predictably, and even though members of the community supported it, completely predictably, uh, this caused deep alienation, and particularly among young people, and only reinforced this sense of the occupying army as opposed to partners in public safety. All of this comes to a head in 1990 as they have 150 homicides in Boston, which was an historical high. 73 of those victims were 24 years of age or younger. And in 1992, uh, we have the um, release of what was called the St. Clair Report. And that report uh, did something that at least was eye-opening for me. Um, and it's something I think we have to think about even in the context of our current uh, attempts to really change what's happening in the realm of uh, police violence. That report showed, at least in Boston at that time, that about 10 to 15 percent of officers accounted for about 80 percent of complaints. And what was eye-opening for me was to realize that the police had a problem. Now, they have other issues that have to be dealt with as well, institutional and societal, but that they have a problem not unlike the same problem we have in almost any profession. We have it in the clergy. Probably 10 or 15 percent of people produce uh, the significant, the highest number of your, of your uh, serious complaints. Um, I know it's true in medicine. Five to 10 percent of physicians account for a very large number of your malpractice suits. And so what, one of the things that we had to come to grips with was the fact that sometimes in the community we had done to police what we accused police of doing to us. And that was stereotyping all cops because of the behavior of some cops. Now, again, we have to look at how the institution operates. We have to look at the policies that it uh, sets in place. We have to look at its accountability mechanisms. And that's got to be particularly true when people have the right to deprive you of liberty or life. The standards go even higher. But it was important for us, if we were going to get serious about changing the dynamics in the community, to begin to think, are there police we can partner with? Are there police that we need to resist? Are there police who, if the tone is set differently, will tend to go with that tide rather than the current sort of occupying army culture? So all of these are the things that are kind of roiling in the background. 
In 1990, the, the city sets up a city street workers program. This is absolutely crucial, as I'll share with you a little bit later. These were the very first partners that we had. In fact, the call of God really came from the street workers. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll share you, with you exactly how that happened. Uh, in 1990, and this was the first police unit with which we began a partnership, uh, the gang unit. In 1992, uh, as Boston committed itself to Community Policing Institute, that was the indication that we also could find additional partners, particularly in the command staff of the city of Boston. Operation Nightlight, won't go into all the details, but this was the first indication that the probation officers could be partners in this process. Uh, then in 1992, the Youth Violence Strike Force, which very conveniently really brought all the sort of law enforcement folks who were very much involved in this so that we really had one table at which we could sit and begin both to develop partnerships and hold each other accountable. 1996 was the start of what was called Operation Ceasefire, which was that first police, probation, and then community collaboration. And I say all of this because in most of the accounts, again, they will talk about the role of the police, or this study will look at the role of clergy. And my argument is, without the partnership, none of this could have happened. We simply couldn't have had the greatest decrease in violence in any American city without the partnership. And all of the members of that partnership were really crucial. So as we like to say over and over again, as the old song declares, we're in this thing <laughs> together. So let me share a word about the Boston Ten Point Coalition. Before I get to where it is, let me tell you exactly how it got started. 1992, prior to that time, uh, we had been involved in, on a by church basis, uh, working with some of the young people, particularly in gangs around our local churches. But in 1992, an event occurred on May 14th that really changed the landscape altogether. On that day, um, Morningstar Baptist Church, uh, which had long been one of the places in the community from which young people were buried when they were killed, mm -hmm. uh, and had made a tremendous ministry of trying to help those families through this inexpressible and, and sometimes crushing grief. They were holding a service for a, a young man who was not gang affiliated. Uh, unfortunately, many of his friends were gang affiliated. He went to a party, uh, and when a fight broke out between two opposing gangs on the porch, someone shot through the window, and he caught a bullet in his head. Mm -hmm. uh, the funeral was held at Morning Star. Members of the gang, his friends, came. And at this point, they've got two things going on. They are both uh, angry, but they're also deeply guilty because Bobby didn't have a nickel in this quarter, as they say. Mm -hmm. He wasn't involved at all. Also showing up at the funeral was another young man by the name of Jerome. Jerome um, was affiliated with a third gang that was affiliated with the gang responsible for Bobby's death. At this point, the gang members assume that the reason Jerome has showed up is as the ultimate sign of disrespect. You guys are so weak. You are so inconsequential. We'll show up at your homeboy's funeral because you're not going to do anything. What they didn't know was that Jerome and Bobby had grown up together. They used to play ball together. And rather than coming to show disrespect, he was there to pay his respects. Mm -hmm. That got lost. And so they went after Jerome in the church in the middle of the funeral, stampeded the mourners, completely disrupted the service, um, and uh, in the process stabbed Jerome several times. He recovered. Um, but um, it, as you can imagine, was just shocking. And shocking not just for that church community, but for all of us. We, we just don't do that in Boston. In Chicago, maybe, maybe in LA, someplace like that, not in Boston. I mean, even our violence has a certain kind of civility and <laughs> you know, rules um, to it. And so we had a situation that, that was both frightening um, and, and quite new for the city of Boston. The following day, uh, as the call went out for clergy to come together and decide what to do, 300 clergy, every faith community showed up. But the real action on that day was not in the church. It was outside in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. 
Because outside in the parking lot, um, several of the city street workers, along with young people, called clergy outside, those who were available, others were working on something, and said, do you want to hold the usual kind of meeting that you hold after tragic incidents like this? Or do you want to meet the young people who are responsible for it? Tell us which is it going to be. And we said, OK, if you'll broker the meeting, we'll come. So at 11 o'clock at night, we found ourselves in a parking lot in uh, one of the housing developments where that particular gang was located. We talked with about 10 young men who went on to express their deep remorse for what had happened, the fact that nobody wanted this to go down the way that it had, um, their expression that if they could cross territory, they would come and tell the pastor and the congregation themselves. Um, um, and, and offer their apologies, to whatever extent that would be helpful. The night after, through the city street workers, we had the opportunity to sit down with the other gang. And after putting us through paces that were entirely appropriate, they said a few things. One, are you here for yourself or are you here for us? And they told us the way that we'll know that that's serious is if we don't read about this in the papers ever, we'll know that this was about us and not about you. Mm -hmm. That was the first rule. And after a series of conversations and people expressing their, their, their frustrations, they said, we'd like to float a proposal by you. We think that the way to get to peace, given the way things have gone down over the past few years, is for us to kill three people on the other side, at which point we'll be even, and then let's call a truce. Now, um, this is not something I was well prepared for in my <laughs> seminary training. But we spent another couple of hours, two or three hours, talking about what's the history here. Let's look at how this has gone down over the years. Has one killing ever resolved anything? Has it ever led to peace that you can remember? And, and as we literally went back through them one by one, we had a group of young men who agreed, no, either we squash it now or it never gets squashed. Mm -hmm. And that was for us as clergy the very first, you might call, gang mediation that we became involved in. And it brought home to us the fact that there were young men and women who were caught up in a war, not of their own making, a war often in the context of their own streets, and they could not often find a way out. But they were very open to people who they believed cared about them to help them find that way out. That was, for me, absolutely eye-opening. Mm -hmm. It also brought home something that we went on to write about. And, and, and I said that, that what this whole era of street violence and its explosion in the United States, but it poses a tremendous challenge to the church, and protect, particularly to the historically black church, to the extent that young black men and women were caught up in it. And we had to ask ourselves all kinds of very hard questions. Questions like whether we would be as willing as the previous generation had been to face the Klan, were we willing to face our own young people caught up in this straight war? That could we be trusted with the enormous amount of dollars that were invested in churches to make those investments in building people and not just building buildings. And could those young people expect us to walk with a certain kind of integrity, not perfection, but a certain kind of integrity uh, that said, we are really committed to the health and the wholeness of this community? And the attempt to answer those questions was really what undergird and led to the formation of this coalition. At the present time, that includes about 17 churches, some two full-time staff, a board of about eight, um, and some 76 volunteers. But that group over the years has been able to do a number of things, and I want to share a little bit about that, and then maybe share some of the things that we've learned about collaboration in that process. We got going in the wake of, uh, of uh, that event at Morningstar in 1992. And we set out as our mission to mobilize the greater Boston community to make violence an unacceptable method of resolving our problems. I'm sorry, let me just press through that. 
Um, the name derived really from 10 points, and these came out of our discussions with young people about what the real needs were and what were the things that churches could do, could address very concretely and very tangibly. Uh, and out of that, 10 points arose. One was to adopt youth gangs. So every church take responsibility for the youth in the three blocks around you, and particularly the gangs that were there. To understand that we could not wait for those who were in need to come to us, we had to go where they were. And that meant sending both mediators and mentors into juvenile, uh, into the courts, into the schools, into the detention facilities, and into the streets. And in particular, we focused on this issue of sending what we would call youth workers, youth pastors even, not just into the confines of the church, but into the streets themselves. We also went on to argue that there had to be uh, concrete economic alternatives to the drug economy. There's great work by Elijah Anderson that showed that the average person in the drug trade, after you subtract um, the bribes that are paid, robberies that are endured, and then time served, if you looked at all of that, nobody made more than minimum wage except for a few people on the very top. So there, there were definitely alternatives that could be offered, but they had to be made real. Uh, we also found out that it was going to be critical to build linkages between downtown and suburban churches and inner city churches and ministries, in part for the resources, but mostly for the policies. What we've discovered over and over again is that it is extremely hard to get policy change if you can't show a relationship to suburban, sometimes rural, but particularly suburban communities. And our mantra over and over again is anything we're dealing with now you're going to be dealing with five to 10 years from now because we're the canary in the mine. And I offer as yet another proof of that, um, that we are now talking about drug abuse as a public health problem, radically different from the approach we took in the 1990s when it was the object of a war. Um, and that war ended up not being on drugs. That war was on the communities where drugs were placed. And, and the mass incarceration uh, that came about at the disruption of families, all of that a consequence of a very different way of thinking about a problem. We discovered that it was going to be important if we were serious about this to build partnerships again. Uh, within neighborhoods to help neighbors come together and become critically engaged in the process of securing the security of their own streets and neighborhoods, to work with the institutions that were there. Uh, we didn't list them at the time. The groups that we began working with actually first were community health centers because even then they were thinking about violence as a public health problem and they were powerful uh, partners in that that we had to give uh, young people an alternative to violent gang life. Sorry, this is a little slow here. Uh, we noticed very early on, uh, both because of the kind of feedback we were getting from academics, but also the stories of the young people that we were working with, that if we were serious about violence in the streets, we had to do something about violence in homes that these were often the precursors. These were sort of the, the soil and the conditions in which um, that, that resort to violence really began. And so dealing with rape, crisis, drop-in centers, services for battered women, counseling for abusive men was an equally critical part of it. And last but not least, uh, helping young people, particularly young people of color, to have a greater sweep of history to look at mm -hmm. as both a sense of their own agency uh, and instilling a sense of hope. Uh, as we would tell young people all the time, I get how uh, pressed down, oppressed you feel, uh, but we've been here before. And let's learn from what people have gone through before to ask how do we apply those lessons in our own day and time. We knew that the people that we needed to focus on really were what were called high risk. Now you would call them proven risk young people. They're already in the game, they're in the gangs, they're already the repeat offenders, uh, they've already displayed violent behaviors, assault and use of weapons, especially guns, uh, and they're part of kind of the leadership cadre of the streets. 
um, those drug dealers in particular who were really looked to and looked up to. And what we had to do were really uh, three things. We had to provide direct services. We had to build capacity, and that included organizing and training institutions uh, and communities. And last but not least, we really had to do advocacy. Mm -hmm. That if we didn't change policy, we were going to constantly be doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I'll share with the, the end of this that we, we feel at this point, or let me say, speak for myself, um, we know pretty well how to work through the spikes in violence in Boston. What we haven't figured out uh, is really how to lower the baseline significantly. So we can get it down to 30 or 40, and then we know it's going to go back up again because there's a several dynamics we haven't changed. And that's what many of us are trying to focus on now, to figure out how we disrupt that dynamic. And again, that's going to take another kind of partnership. And if we have time, I'll be glad to share with you a little bit about that. Uh, I will just spend a little bit of time on some of the direct service programs. Uh, we discovered that in partnership, um, we could do successful gang mediation. Uh, if churches had those connections, or if city uh, street workers had the connection, or if probation officers became involved, they and we could get to the table the necessary partners. And there was enough relationship there to be able to get people to sit down and talk and work things through. And the wonderful thing is that we discovered amazing partners who would be helpful to us, because we needed to be able in a place that was neutral. Our first gang mediation was done at the John F. Kennedy Library uh, mm -hmm. because the, the head of that library um, 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 name just flew out of my head. Um, it'll come back to me in a minute. Uh, had been asking for a long time, what can we do here? What can we do that would make a difference? So when we called him up and said, uh, listen, we need a place to hold a gang mediation, uh, his response immediately was, bring it on. We're willing to do it. So uh, we, we discovered that, in fact, if we could find neutral places um, and get into, the, into those spaces the parties who were engaged, as well as uh, people whom they trusted, we could successfully mediate many of these disputes, just as had been the case in that first uh, instance that I mentioned to you. We also discovered that reentry programs were absolutely crucial, that as people were coming back out getting them redirected so that they didn't continue to fall uh, into that, that uh, cycle of recidivism uh, was absolutely crucial. Uh, memorial programs. Um, these seem like very simple things, uh, attempts to really get people to redirect the anger away from revenge and to first celebrating the life of the, the one that they had lost and then asking, how do we change the dynamic that got our loved one killed? Um, and again, we were able in small ways to sort of follow that through and discover, because we, we'd learned from previous experience that often one year, three years, or five years after the original murder, uh, there would be a revenge killing, not uncommonly on the anniversary or within a day or two. Mm -hmm. And so the whole point of the Memorials Project was to redirect grief in ways that could lead to constructive outcomes. Night walks um, that were really a process of just introducing ourselves to the community and especially to the young people who were there. And then in partnership with schools and community centers, getting to the place where in fact um, we could, through those agencies, identify young people who were at greatest risk, those who were on the edge of being brought into street life or into gang culture and beginning to intervene not only with them, but also with their families. So again, these were some of the kinds of direct services programs that allowed us in partnership uh, to begin to sort of change the dynamics and the direction for young people and their families. And I'm sorry for these duplicate slides. I don't know quite how that happened. OK. And I'm, I'm going to press through that. I won't go through all the details of the, the mediation or the reentry or the memorials. or the night walks, or the drop-in centers. All right. Um, now, as important as the direct services are, if you ask me, they're not the most important. They are critical for the young people who are reached. 
um, they're critical in terms of making it clear to them, their families and the community, that we're there for them. But we were never going to have enough staff or even enough volunteers if we couldn't mobilize across the community other churches, other community agencies. And so the question became, how do we build capacity? And so that meant that with every program, we had a training component, the purpose of which was to say to people, now that you've seen it, now that you've participated in it, go and replicate it in your own neighborhood, replicate it in your own church, and do that in partnership with others. We also discovered that it was important to really have the kind of community engagement for places where generations could sit down and talk to each other, both about their points of misunderstanding, their concerns, the places where they might work together and learn from each other and together be committed to making this community all that they called it to be. And then we discovered that it was important for us to begin talking to other communities. So we were part of a statewide Safe Communities Coalition that was helping us to understand in Boston what could be learned from Brockton and what Brockton could learn from Springfield and what Springfield could learn from Lawrence and what Lawrence could learn from Lowell or any of the other cities that were struggling with the same kinds of problems. Last but not least, we understood that advocacy was critical, um, that we could tell young people to go get jobs, but if we didn't reform the, the, the uh, uh, criminal record system that essentially required them to check a box saying, do you have any kind of, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Because what that meant was before the person ever had a chance to get to know them, before the person ever heard the circumstances of their conviction, that application was going into the waste bin. Because if I've got 10 and I've got somebody here that's going to require me to run a background check and a whole series of other things, I don't need all that hassle. So if we didn't change courier reform, all of our telling young people to go get a good job uh, really didn't mean a whole lot. We had to be advocates. If we weren't willing to go and find funding for summer activities that offered a positive alternative, and, and that included finding funding from the state, um, then in fact we had to be willing to be advocates. When it came to uh, the most recent uh, comprehensive criminal justice reform, this is something in the case of Ten Point we've been working on for about 15 years. Um, and, and this, uh, you know, I say all the time to people, um, uh, if you think that voting is enough, now, I want you to vote. <laughs> but if you're not really willing to be engaged with the process thereafter, if you can't find a way to make your voice heard, if you're not going to keep in touch with at least one issue and keep the pressure on, because the, getting the person into office is just the beginning. Uh, getting the legislation passed is just the beginning. The regulations have got to be written. The appropriation has to be made. And it's got to be done the following year. And there's always somebody who wants the money that's appropriated for that purpose. So if you don't stand up and speak for it, I can guarantee you it will disappear. So this process of comprehensive uh, 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 criminal justice reform has literally been a partnership of organizations all across the state for 15 years. And what we got when, we first, when it first came out, um, there was a whole group that was put together to study this. What we got was great, but it only worked on the, f the back end after people were already in prison. And it was the advocates who had to go and stand at the state house and say, this is a good start. But if you don't keep people from getting there in the first place, we haven't succeeded. And this is what we want. Four things, we laid them all out and so on. So what became clear to us over and over again is that if we, if we weren't really willing to look at systemic change, if we weren't really willing to step up and advocate, we were never going to change this cycle or dynamic. And that also required partnership. Let me just give you some overview of, of the results on the ground. And this is not in any way to pat ourselves on the back. It really is to talk about the difference that partnership can make. And this comes from the study done by Anthony Braga, Chris Winship, who was the former chair of the Department of Sociology at Harvard University. They declare Bo uh, Boston received national acclaim for its innovative approach to preventing youth violence. The ceasefire strategy was associated with a near two-thirds drop in youth homicide in the late 1990s. We actually went for 30 months 
with no youth homicides. Mm -hmm. The Boston approach was also noted for its extraordinary police community relationships spearheaded by the 10-point coalition of activist black clergy. And again, that, that's not an accurate description, but we'll let it stand for the moment. The involvement of uh, ministers in the ceasefire strategy provided a mechanism of transparency and accountability to the minority community that conferred the legitimacy necessary to pursue aggressive intervention with high-risk youth. Given the history of poor race relations in the city of Boston, it was remarkable that any group of black community members was able to forge such a highly productive partnership with the Boston Police Department. And as I said before, many, many other partners as well. Uh, in the case of those who came into reentry, we saw the recidivism fall from 44% to 10%. Uh, we were looking at program costs per participant that were about 5,300 a year versus the average cost of 23,000 for an inmate. So this is not only the right thing to do, it's actually the smart thing to do. Shootings by gang mediation initiative gangs representing some of the most violent groups in Boston decreased by 39% between 2007 and 2009. And that's the period in which we really ramped up the gang mediation work. And again, this comes from the study of uh, the work of Dr. Anthony Braga at the Kennedy School. And I show you this slide, uh, which I should have on a graph, but I'm not terribly good with uh, uh, PowerPoint graphs, so I, I, I put it in this way. Um, and, and you'll see these peaks that I've talked about. And whenever there's a peak, an alarm goes up, everybody gets mobilized, and we always get it back down again. Um, but I'm going to argue, and we'll, we'll look at this at the end, that we've got to do better than that, and that's going to require some even uh, different kinds of partnership. I just want to emphasize um, the, the number of partners who are in this process. And I've put them in big letters to the Black Ministerial Alliance because uh, we worked out with them the ultimate partnership. Uh, we decided that they were a great organization with tremendous administrative skills. Uh, they were an excellent intermediary organization. So why should we have an administrative back office when they had a great one? And so we literally turned all of our administrative work over to them, which saved us money and helped to support them as an organization. And we've managed, as a consequence of that, um, to be able to also forge an even tighter alliance. We've worked very tightly with the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, and that's been the basis of some of that interfaith dialogue uh, to which uh, Dr. Paul Sell um, referred. Uh, we worked along with the Jewish Community Relations Council, which has been uh, a partner in this probably for 22 years, um, and the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Boston. That's just the faith-based faith -based partners. In the public sector, the city of Boston, the Boston Public Schools, the Boston Police Department, the Boston School Police Department, Suffolk County Corrections, the District Attorney's Office, and I'm not just saying that these are passing acquaintances, these are actually direct programs that we've been involved in with those partners. The Massachusetts Probation Department, the Boston Public Health Commission, the Mass Department of Youth Services. Private sector, uh, we've discovered that there were great opportunities, particularly for high risk and proven risk kids in the case of some companies that were willing, particularly for summer jobs, to reach out for those young people. If the deal was uh, we, as the community organizations, would be willing to be there in the event that things begin to go off the rails. And that would happen in the course of a summer, once or twice. You probably can't ask your public sector partner um, to work it out when two young people go at it with each other. One of us needs to be there to kind of intervene. But they're more than happy to provide the mentors, more than happy to provide the jobs. And I can't say enough about the academic partners, because uh, sometimes in the church, we're not big on checking outcomes, um, mm -hmm. actually looking at results, evaluating ourselves. We just assume that we're doing good things, and so the results must be good. What these partners have forced us to do is to keep looking at what we're doing, asking if we're doing the best thing, could we do it better, and they've also been invaluable in helping us find other models that we could incorporate, look at, um, help to keep us in the process of continually improving what we're doing. 
I'm going to stop there just for a moment. Any questions? Because I've covered a lot up to this point. Then I want to just make a few points about the role of collaboration. Yes? I'm interested in how you're able to replace the drug dealing with other economic means. Mm -hmm. um, can you just mention what some of those examples might be? Well, again, um, in some cases, it's as simple as saying to people, right, uh, I want to sit down and go through what we would call the Elijah Anderson calculation, where literally we would have people sit down and think through what they've made, but average it out. Mm -hmm. Make all the appropriate business deductions, including bribes, robberies, all of that, and then average it out, put in all the jail time that you spent and prison time, what have you made per hour? And almost invariably, it's less than minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Right. Starting point. Because then the other problem is at this point very often, if I've got a record, I know that there's not much of a job market for me. So this is where, again, having the relationships and often the community-based businesses were the, were the best starting place. Um, folks who themselves had had brushes with the law, who were willing to take young men and young women in. Um, and so that was often the starting point. And then you start to build a little bit of a resume. And now you can begin to look at other kinds of job opportunities. The other piece that has to work along with that, obviously, in some cases, is the skills building. And this gets back to the GED programs, uh, the community colleges, other avenues that could actually get people thinking about a different trajectory for their life. But you work that through with people. In terms of all the agencies that you work with, um, I'm thinking of the um, young youth who are getting into crimes uh, or gangs, mm -hmm. um, how do you prevent them from getting a record? Um, because um, a record is you know, such a, a mark and it destroys people's um, advances. Depending on what it is that you're dealing with, that, that um, do, do you Courts? have to report it to the police? Um, to report what? Activities to, to the police. No, I mean, and generally you're not going to, unless you're concerned about a threat to someone's life. Okay. Yeah, so in that, I mean, we became aware that people had done a number of things. Even if you report it, there's not enough evidence mm -hmm. to, that, that that becomes a basis for anybody being convicted of anything. So you do have to keep confidences. You learn things that, that have been done that have taken place. Um, but in most instances, and this, the wonderful thing is the police respected that as well. It's the same problem that city street workers have to work through all the time. You know, well, I'll give you one example. Um, they talk about these ceasefire agreements that were mentioned in one of the, uh, the quotes here. And this, this involved, um, um, it was actually sort of developed by an academic and then actually tested out by the police and refined. What it would involve typically is when, when a group would begin to become very active, you'd actually bring them into a community setting or into a court. Uh, the first part of the process was for the police to get up and show the, the gang members all the intelligence that they had on them. And this was gleaned from sometimes wiretaps, uh, cell phone taps. It was gleaned from going through people's trash. Um, by the time it was over, they knew who was doing what and who was related to whom. They'd lay all that out. You would have um, prosecutors who would stand up and who would say, this will be the last time that when I come to you, it will be to help you. The next time that you see me, I'm going to be trying to lock you up for a long time. Um, they would ask community person, uh, the clergy, community organizations to come and talk about their availability to help people take an alternative pathway. And then often the most searing and most effective plea would come from mothers, grandmothers, uh, fathers who had lost children, 
and who would stand up and talk to the young men and sometimes young women about the role, the, the road that they were on and where it was leading and the incredible pain that they carried because of the loss of their child. The, the most powerful one that I can remember was a situation where the mother who was speaking knew that one of the young men there was responsible for the death of her son. Everybody in that room knew. Couldn't be proven, but everyone knew. And so the, the clear message was, you know, you're, you're standing at a crossroads. You've got to make a choice. Because if, if you don't take this road, here's where it's going. And um, that, that particular approach, and it's been used really across the, uh, across the country, turns out to be very, very effective. Um, you mentioned the diversity of sort of faith organizations, um, but can you just say something about the actual diversity of churches themselves? You talked about um, having partnerships with suburban churches. Mm -hmm. I mean, has that been very successful? Have you managed to get people from very different backgrounds and situations involved? There have been some successes, and again, um, out of that initially, for example, we have a suburban church partnership that's about 25 years old. Um, it goes back to the very beginning of this process. And we've not only sort of collaborated on this work around uh, reaching out to young people, but our, our youth groups have worked together. We've supported each other in global work. Um, uh, we become engaged in some of the uh, uh, issues of race and equity dialogues and so on. So there have been a number of things that have kind of grown out of that. Um, but I would still say that the numbers of those are still relatively small. And, and quite frankly, building those collaborations hasn't been as strong or successful as I would have hoped. Uh, the last thing I will say, the, probably the place that we've been most helped there has been through Greater Boston Interfaith Organization. Mm -hmm. That's been a um, kind of a continuing uh, context for people to, to remain in relationship. So I would say in the last six, seven, eight years, primarily through that organization, mm -hmm. we've seen that's, that's been much stronger. Has the METCO program been helpful in terms of um, the work that you do where you know, people, uh, young black students go out to various communities for school? Um, and I have a second question then mm -hmm. too, and maybe you can address both sure. of them. So there's, somehow there's a, um, a it, it's, I've read or heard that young people often when they are, um, are pressured into gang membership, and how much of a choice do you feel young people have when they are surrounded by a gang in their neighborhood? Is that changing, I guess, at all over the years with all the work and the opportunities maybe that you see? It varies a lot from neighborhood to neighborhood, but in a lot of neighborhoods, most young people are not involved in gangs. I'll show you some data a little bit later that's sort of interesting. Um, but again, the pressure can come as a matter of protection uh, the pressure can come because uh, it's the one place where you can feel some sense of family and, um, uh, and affiliation. The pressure can come because it's the, the means that you have to generate funds that you actually need uh, to support your family. So again, it can come from a lot of, of a, a lot of different sources. But not every young person will, will have to, in, in a community, will have to be involved in care. And on METCO, um, no, and the only reason is because there aren't very many proven risk kids in METCO, mm -hmm. right? And so we were only searching for that population. Love METCO's work, I think it provides a great opportunity for young people. Um, most of those young people are, are not going to be in that proven risk category. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I think we have one more here. Mm -hmm. Reverend Hammond, first, it's such a privilege to hear from you. Thank you for being here tonight. But I wanted to ask you, over the course of this period of time, how the nature of the work has changed. I, I was in the Attorney General's office through the 90s and early 2000s, and I just remember this sense of such, like the, the solution had been found. 
you know, through, this, through all of this collaboration. I also knew that we had to keep the 10-point coalition a secret because nobody could know it was a 10-point <laughs> coalition or it wouldn't work. But, but this, you know, this tremendous sense of optimism and pride in Boston in terms of what was being achieved through these kinds of collaborations. But I, I'm just curious how that's changed over the 25 years because, you know, dynamics change, the nature of crime changes, social media, like how, how has this changed over that period of time? Wonderful you should say that. Let, let me then run through these slides very quickly because I know we've got to have some time for a little bit of a conversation here. A couple of lessons that we've learned around this issue of collaboration. Always think of collaboration as unnatural acts between unconsenting adults. <laughs> and, and we laugh, but it's really true. Collaboration is extremely difficult to make work. Right? And we'll talk about why that's the case. Um, there is so much working against it. There are the historical barriers. We've never done this before. You hear this in churches, you hear this in organizations, you hear this in all kinds of contexts. It's just a way of saying this is different and I don't quite know what to do with it. Um, you have to deal with the barriers, of, which you might call sort of philosophical barriers. Uh, one of the big issues that we have when we started talking about working with the police or working with private sector partners were some of the very concerns. Where's the confidentiality barriers? Do we lose the trust of young people if they know that we're also in conversation with the police? Um, and as I say, it's not just our issues, but it's also the, the context for, the, um, uh, for city street workers or youth workers. Um, there's also always the big concern, um, if we get involved with the public sector, for example, do we become politically compromised? Or if we take funding that meet for the purpose of services, are we now dancing to someone else's tune? One of the things that we determined, for example, in uh, 10 point very early on is that we would never take more than 15% government funding because we figured we could take a 15% hit and keep going. Um, and we had seen too many organizations basically uh, hamstrung because they wanted to stand up on an advocacy issue, but that meant going up against somebody who was going to get them a line item in the state budget. So that's a decision that we made. We, that isn't true for every direct service organization. But if you're going to be in advocacy, you have to absolutely think about how you're not going to be compromised. So these are the tough issues when you get into the issue of, of um, building collaboration. You, you also have what I call the vision barrier. Can our institution make room for this in an already busy agenda? There are things we're, we're being asked to do and that we're being held accountable to do, and now you're adding one more thing on top of that because collaboration always is time and uh, uh, relationally intensive. There is the barrier in terms of infrastructure. There are the internal demands of the organization. There are the community demands. There are all the issues of funds, staffing, and training. Uh, and the leadership development. Um, that said, um, th there are a few things that we found were really crucial in terms of building collaborations that would stand. First, to understand that relationships should always precede resources. Mm -hmm. That before people started talking about sharing money, they better share trust. Mm -hmm. Because something is always going to come up that will challenge the relationship. And if you haven't built trust first, the collaboration will break down invariably. I've seen it over and over again. So failure to pay attention to building the relationships and building the trust dooms the collaboration almost from the beginning. Second point, you've got to de uh, really develop a vision of what that collaboration might look like and it's got to be concrete. You've got to be able to explain it to people uh, and that, that vision has to be communicated to both organizations and certainly uh, those who have to implement it and, and make it work. <clears throat> Thirdly, um, someone as a part of their job has to take responsibility for maintaining the relationships and sustaining the collaboration. If it's everybody's responsibility, it's nobody's responsibility. Right? And I, I could give you stories for every one of these points, but I want to get to this last piece here. Relationships and collaborations that are not nurtured absolutely will die. 
They don't you know, maintain themselves organically or naturally. And you have to be serious about finding ways to measure, celebrate, and share your successes. Through that, build momentum that can really sustain the collaboration and draw others to it. Um, I'm going to jump through these slides very quickly because you raised the question about have things changed. And let me, let me close, if I can, on that. I think they've changed. And that's not to say that people who are still doing the kinds of things we're doing in the 90s are barking up the wrong tree. They're not. We still need active intervention. We still need the kind of advocacy that was involved. We've still got policies that need to be changed. Um, but beginning about 10, 12 years ago, the question for me was, why can't we seem to get this lower baseline down? Mm -hmm. Why do we seem to continue through this you know, kind of bell curve sine wave, right? And I think we did some interesting research, um, and I'll share that with you very quickly, and then we'll close out. Uh, they asked a series of very important questions. This was through the police department, Northeastern University, and a whole series of community organizations. And the beginning question was very simple, and it's about my neighborhood. This is the community I live in called Grove Hall. Who are the individuals when it comes to crime that are creating the problem? What do we know about them? What do we need to learn? What they discovered was that 457 people in my neighborhood were responsible for every um, uh, arra court arraignment uh, every field arrest, every arrest, and so on, uh, over the period of time that was looked at. It was a three-year period. Those 457 people had generated 12,000 arraignments in their lifetime. And they represented 2.4% of my neighborhood's residents. Mm -hmm. And this isn't violence. We know, for example, through the brick list, that there are about 300 people in the entire city of Boston who generate almost all the violence know their names, know their addresses, know their affiliations. There's actually someone in the PAC program, the public health department, whose job is to know those 300 people, right? So, um, small number. What was really exciting about this approach was that they then ran those same names against the database for the Office of Health and Human Services, and not surprisingly, they got a 72% match. Uh, so what was clear was that the folks that law enforcement was working with were the same folks that mental health and public health and um, uh, transitional assistance and children and families, all of them, they were working with the same population of folks, largely. And then uh, a series of questions were asked, who needed um, a prevention program? Uh, who needed an intervention program, because in many cases they were already in the mix, and who needed an enforcement. Um, and the last thing I'll say on this is I, I don't have any compunctions if someone is really disrupting community in doing everything I can to get them locked up for two reasons. I will save someone else's life, and I will probably save theirs. Um, I have two family members who, between them, have done 20 years in prison. Both have been shot. One's done mur time for murder and the other for attempted murder. They will tell you to this day, uh, for the two of them, and I'm not saying this is, works for everybody, if I hadn't gone to prison, I would not be alive. Because the trajectory I was on and the way that I was going. And so again, I don't, I don't have any... Uh, at all compunctions about that. I, without doubt, we lock up far too many people. But I, I know people for whom they need time off of the streets. So we've got three things that we asked for in terms of those who um, were looked at. What was then done, which was really exciting, was to begin not only to look at those individuals, but to ask about their family trees and their family systems. And I'm going to very quickly run through what we're really trying to think about and focus on next. This is one subsection of five family systems in my neighborhood that account for a very large number of those 457 individuals. This is showing you just for this one subsection, and these names are all obviously uh, different, um, how many people over four generations have ever been arrested? All right. And then how many have been incarcerated over four generations? 
How many are currently under the supervision of the legal system? How many have been gang involved? This was a, another eye opener because we had always said the multi-generational gangs like the Gangster Disciples or the Crips and Bloods don't exist in Boston. We were right, but we were wrong. They don't, uh, the same gang doesn't go from generation to generation, but gang involvement does go multi-generationally. We wanted to find out how many of them were firearms, either suspect victims or both, three generations deep. Assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, three generations deep. Domestic violence reported. Drug possession or distribution, four generations deep. And then when you start looking at other indicators, uh, graduation from high school, and then particularly ask how many had gotten tracked into special education. How many cases were there that involved what looked like a, a child abuse or abandonment? Mental health involvement? Substance abuse? And other agency involvement. So where we're now looking is what can we as community, church, and state agencies do on the front end instead of the back end for these families. Because we think that that's a large part of that baseline we just can't get rid of. Well, Ray, thank you so much for that. Um, amazing presentation. Um, I have a question before we open it out, which is when churches did adopt gangs in their neighborhoods, what did it look like when it went well? Um, again, um, can't say enough about the power of partnership, right? Yeah. I, I know this, I sound like a broken record. Um, we had an interest in doing it, uh, and we put the word out that we were interested, and what really made it happen was a city street, work, street worker by the name of Jim McGilvery, who was excellent. And basically, Jim came to us with a proposal. He says, I've got kids. Um, you've got volunteers, mm -hmm. vans, and a building. Mm -hmm. Let's work together. Uh, and we started, a, as a consequence of that, a whole series of groups, uh, group sessions, talks, discussions, uh, and then later other kinds of intervention around work and school. Um, but all of it, is, again, is a partnership essentially between our church and the city street mm -hmm. workers. And mm -hmm. other churches were able to do that similarly. It was then Jim who actually came back and said, um, you're dealing with mostly young guys right now, but I've got young women who have mm -hmm. a tremendous need as well. And that was the beginning of a program that Glory and a number of the women in our church began. Mm -hmm. Uh, called Do the Right Thing, W-R-I-T-E, um, where the focus was on using arts and writing as a means of getting a trauma that young women had experienced in their life and ultimately um, began to grow out into other, other efforts as well. So um, that, that turned out to be relatively easy. If you, if you could build a relationship with your city street worker, you had an immediate entree to a whole group of young people. Lori, I don't know if you um, have anything you would like to add to this conversation. Your partner and co-pastor, you've been involved in this work in a long t for a long time. I am Gloria. Um, I'm Ray's lovely wife. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> it really, it, I'd say in the earliest days of our congregation, it was a critical piece of our connecting outside of the church. And really, so one of the things our church is really involved with now is a number of social justice issues, but it really began with us looking around our neighborhoods and, yeah. and figuring out what can we do to address the crises that are, that are right up on us that we don't, that there's no way to avoid. And so this, 
this work, the work of Ten Point Coalition, again, the strength of partnerships has, was, we learned that early on and it very much informs the way that we work now. I don't, I don't know how you do this in isolation, especially with some of the thorny issues that we, we are facing now as a, not only as a neighborhood, but as a country. So very grateful for the opportunity, very proud of my handsome husband for all he done did. <laughs> Well, let me s turn to the members of the RPP seminar and uh, see if there are questions there, please. That, is, is there anybody in the working group that is, has been eagerly awaiting their moment? I just want to make sure I give you your moment. Okay, the floor is yours. <laughs> First of all, I'm involved with the reentry program, mm -hmm. and we're looking to get some um, people coming out of Suffolk House of Corrections employment. So I want to talk to you afterwards. Absolutely. Um, about some employers that would be willing to do that. And we want to get people that are um, T accessible. That would be very helpful for the people. Fantastic. Um, and the second thing is, so I've worked in three DYSs, and one of the things that concerned me, and I saw it right up there on the graph, is what I would call triple involved kids. DYS, DCF, DMH, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes these systems um, sometimes just logistically have trouble giving good services, um, and not, not any individual maliciousness, but just, and I'm wondering, I'm, I would be interested in being part of something which targets those kids. I'm also very interested, I didn't see it there, I saw special education, mm -hmm. but I get very concerned with the kids in DYS that I saw who would read at the third or fourth grade reading level. Because mm -hmm. I think what that does to your pride and your feeling of, your feeling of agency mm -hmm. um, is just horrible. So, so anyway, those are the four concerns I have. So fix it before the, we leave tonight. OK. Yeah. <laughs> or, or let me know how I can help fix it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you Love talk much. with you afterward, absolutely. <laughs> Please. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a, now I'm losing my train of thought. I'm a clinical social worker. I spent the last, uh, most of my career at a psych emergency room in Cambridge, and then the last couple of years at the Cambridge Police Department in a newly created social work position. And one thing that you mentioned, partnerships, was, was critical at the time when I started. We, um, myself along with one of the sergeants there, started a stakeholders meeting, and he, in community relations, wasn't, uh, wasn't clear about how to do it, and I was learning about law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So together, you know, we worked out just going all around Cambridge and going from Cambridge Hospital to the Riverside Clinic to the trauma centers and going from five people to 40 people. And in that room, having the agenda of just building relationships to improve outcomes. Mm -hmm. And it's only a couple of years old, but in, in that short time, it's clear that in this small town, uh, of, you know, with a lot of resources, there was an enormous disconnect mm -hmm. with some of these players who, people who were, you know, in mental health and homelessness or, you know, everybody was working with them, but we, they weren't connecting to collaborate to improve the outcomes. So I think your model of partnership is, is really inspiring. And um, I think each community needs to dig deeper in building those relationships. Um, and um, again, I, although I'm a great proponent, I, know, I completely appreciate the high cost of it. And I understand yeah. why more people don't do it. And, um, and I know some of the folks from Bethel had to, to leave, but uh, I tell them all the time how appreciative I am. Because what it means is I've got a congregation that um, doesn't get upset if I show up at the hospital the second day or the third day mm -hmm. because I went to a community meeting. Right. Um, it, it, You've got to have that kind of common, I think, vision and commitment, and organizations have to have it. I mean, I mean, you have to release people from some of the internal demands, because in some ways you're making an investment for something that potentially could be much big, much greater, and more powerful. And the but it's hard to get people to see that. Yeah, I think the cost is, you know, you you get the director of the ED here or the head of psychiatry in the court clinic to come and sit in this community meeting, and all of a sudden they know each other, and the quality. So quality is improved, and the morale is up. Because morale across, mm. uh, the, in the hospital it's tanked, in the court clinic it's tanked, at the police station it's low. And when you connect everyone, it, it, it affects the morale. Yeah. And I just wanted to say one other thing. 
someone was talking about how to employ people. There's inner city weightlifting. Have you mm -hmm. heard of that program? Sure, know it well. So yeah. that program I connected uh, with and was. It's two blocks from the Cambridge Police Department, and no one at the police department knows of it. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary model for anyone. You can just Google it and look it up, and you go in and you start working out with these young men who are high-impact players who everyone says are too dangerous to work with, mm -hmm. and they're on the ground doing a plank with you, just eye-to-eye -eye saying, you can do it, you can do it. And it's just, it's incredible. And the one young man I worked with went from there he said, I got to go. I'm going to Boston Sports Club because I'm working there tonight for 80 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, he, it was just incredible if you give people an opportunity to, you know, be with their humanity and see them. Absolutely. What they can do. Mm -hmm. They don't need $18 an hour. They can do a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you very much for that lecture. Uh, some good memories, some bad memories. Mm. Uh, I just want to find out from you what effect Minister Farah can had when he came here, the men's only lecture that he gave. Did he make things worse for you guys working on the other hand, or did he make it better? Or is there any effect at all? And no effect that I could think of in, in many respects. Um, uh, I mean, certainly I would say the Nation of Islam has been for a very long time in, involved in, in working with people. And, and I'd say particularly in the last few years, the working relationship I think has gotten a lot, lot better. So one of the people who's been deeply involved in the reentry work is uh, one of the ministers there, Trusi Allah, and we've worked well with him and so on. So th that particular event, and again, it's not because of Minister Farah Khan or, or not. My experience is that individual events can be somewhat catalytic. It's the follow-up that means everything. Right. Right. Um, so they can, they can get a person thinking about a different kind of alternative, but if that doesn't quickly get connected to a, a process that's, that's going to see them through, and particularly see them through the times when they get discouraged or things are not working out. I mean, you're just going to end up with relapse. So again, I would, I, I would say that um, it, it, it wasn't a harm or particularly a help. Uh, certainly members of the nation, I think, who are on the ground here have been, I think, very helpful in some cases. Lauren. Thank you so much, Reverend Hammond. Um, I had a question about partnership, and it comes from some of the work that I've done studying partnership in another context where someone said to me, you know, there's a really fine line between collaborating and being used. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could say just a little bit, especially I think clergy, are always at risk of like being dragged out onto the stage as like kind of uh, a symbol of moral uh, fortitude or something like that, especially in your relationship with the police department, which had historically been so fraught. Can you say a little bit about how you both convinced yourselves internally that you were not being used and how you managed the optics of that? Yeah, I, you know, this is very, very important. And um, one of the best ways I can think about reflecting it is, uh, is, is often the way it's addressed, for example, in the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, or in community organizing in general. You've got to know clearly what your own interests are. What are the things that are important to you? What is it that you want to accomplish? And, and you need to be upfront about that. Um, uh, at some point, you've got to have those kind of conversations of this is what I would hope this partnership could accomplish. And let's negotiate that, and then let's begin to lay out a process for how we're going to get there. Uh, because I think, it, again, if, if one person knows what they're after and the other person doesn't, mm -hmm. well, the person who doesn't is going to get used. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things, and this is often very diff not all, you know, I think it can be difficult for clergy, um, is to really sit down and think through in very concrete terms what is it that you want to get accomplished through this partnership. And then what the, I think the wonderful thing is as it grows over time, you discover that there are, there are potential outcomes you hadn't imagined in the beginning. Yeah. Um, 
but you're, you're absolutely right. I think that, the, and each partner has to have some clarity about that. Thank you. Yes, in the back. How does funding work? Oh, sorry. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, the, there's a question in the back, and then we'll come up to you. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for this presentation tonight. I am Wendy. I'm a lawyer, multidisciplinary researcher, mm -hmm. and I've been in, uh, integrating law and medicine in understanding the cause of violence and terrorism, mm -hmm. causation, mm -hmm. and then violence and terrorism cessation. Mm -hmm. And I go back to 10,000 BC in my investigation. Mm -hmm. I am pretty sure that my research can help you get those numbers down even lower. Great, love to talk with you. I would about like it. to talk with you about sure. joining your partnership. <laughs> sure. Um, and my, my my research has been a long journey. I was teaching at Stanford when I began doing this research, and my degrees are from Oxford in England and from Columbia Law School. I'm very passionate about helping the world understand the cause of the violence and terrorism, so we can work at stopping. Love to talk to you about it, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. I'm just curious with the partnerships, how funding works mm -hmm. for like some of the programs. Well, um, in some cases there's, there's no uh, funding. It may be primarily a kind of a referral mechanism. Uh, in a number of instances, as I say again, uh, we have jointly applied, for example, with programs, and this again is where the negotiation up front is so important and being so specific about what each of us is going to do and deliver and what's an appropriate um, uh, portion of whatever the resources are. Uh, and this, this again is, I think, often the conversations that people find it hard because, of course, we all trust each other, right? Well, it's not a matter of trust. What we're doing is making sure that there's not misunderstanding. Because if I'm thinking that for what I'm doing, really 60% of the resources are appropriate, and your sense is that 40 is appropriate, um, w when it comes time and I'm only getting 40, there's not going to be a very happy camper in the coalition. So. That's the kind of thing, as I say, that, that we've got to get, I think, a lot better about talking about up front, negotiating up front, understanding, again, that this isn't any lack of trust. It's precisely because we don't want to rupture the trust that we're going to be clear and write it down. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm Estelle Record Stanley, and I was the first person in my family to go to college. <laughs> uh, and I was going to go save the world and the black community of Rochester, New York. Uh, I wasn't ready. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been trying to find out what I needed to find out since then. And at one point in my graduate work at Boston College in sociology, I supported myself by becoming a toddler teacher because seventh grade is too late. Two years old are my people. Mm -hmm. But I found that the teachers could go to all the training, and Massachusetts is good in, in early childhood, and they would say yes and the, to everybody. But when they really were facing a toddler that to them was being inappropriate, mm. the message that they were following was from their preacher's Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. So I am now called, I think, to go after the preachers in the white churches. I'm leaving my black preacher friends to you. <laughs> <laughs> they will listen. But so I, I, it's really important for everybody to learn how to collaborate and how to work together, which GBIO is great at. Black Ministerial Alliance is pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, Unite Boston is an interesting case on Absolutely. how that gets together. So we'll be in touch uh, <laughs> through our various connections. Uh, but if anybody knows uh, how to connect with the more conservative 
white churches. Mm -hmm. I think that's where God's calling me because unfortunately I'm Queen Esther today for my Jewish friends and my people are the working white, mm -hmm. are the poor white people. I'm, I haven't gotten used to saying that. But we need, to, we need to hear them because the guns are not in the hands of people who look like you. The guns nowadays in mass shootings mm -hmm. are people who look like me. And I think we all need, from the, from the ministerial point of view, to look at that, to begin some conversations that have not happened, uh, because people who don't feel heard vote where we don't want them to vote, mm -hmm. and they shoot where we don't want them to shoot. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where's our mic? Excellent. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. I, the 10 Point Coalition is a really wonderful initiative and it sounds like something that could be replicated in other cities. Have other cities approached you and asked how can they do this where they are and what has, if so, what has been the outcome of them trying to? Absolutely, uh, and I, I can't give you as much of the data on the outcome, but I can recommend the person you can talk to is uh, Reverend Jeffrey Brown, who's mm -hmm. still very much involved in that work in, mm -hmm. in talking with other cities. Uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. I've really limited my time to, to, uh, to Boston, though from time to time I'll go to other places and kind of talk with them about it. Um, uh, so I, I, I would definitely put you in touch with him to get a sense of how. But I, I think the key thing that in, in past years as we've talked to people is here's some things we've learned, here's some approaches we've taken. You've got to figure out what works best in your city because your, your political situation, your history, um, where you are in the whole community policing spectrum, who your best partners are, it's gonna be radically different there than it is here. Mm -hmm. So here's our story, here's what we've learned, um, and, and we're happy to help you think about it, but literally each city is gonna be it, it, its own uh, sort of unique set of partners. Gloria, I would, oh, sorry, Dean, I'll come to you in a second. Um, I was struck when you said, you know, that that all of the many things that Bethel has been involved in, all the issues um, and the great work you all have been doing, it was really grounded in these original projects in the 80s and 90s, and and that there might be something here for us as a nation. And I'm wondering if either of you care to speak to that. Um, I mean, one of the things that's so powerful, I think, is exactly what you just said in response to that question, that you've really been local, you've really focused on this context and what will work here, and you know the people here, and you've built relationships here, but um, I wonder if you, if you can speak to that, um, what you have learned from this work over such a long period of time how we might put it to use mm -hmm. in a nation when we're so divided from each other and not cooperating. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm impressed that it's, um, that this, this is, it's an ongoing work mm -hmm. uh, that um, in, in, in which you, we just don't arrive. And, uh, and so it's the kind of work where um, one, you don't get weary in well-doing, yeah. uh, and two, you, it, it has to happen in the context of community. Right. Uh, there are really no lone range, none of this gets done as a lone ranger. Right. And, uh, and so we've, um, we've certainly, uh, the relationship that we share is just really critical. And then doing it in the context of, for us, our church community has been um, especially important. We, we, have, we have not been that church where the big idea is for the two of us to be out there and then, um, and, and, and then claiming that our church is involved. It's absolutely none of this could happen without a broader community. Many of, some of the people are in this room 
today. And so there are uh, much of the work that we've done, whether it's been sexual victimization, um, uh, this, this anti-violence work. We have an, a, a wonderful project with reentry where some of the people that we worship with and are greeters and <coughs> just doing everyday things are, are individuals who have, were incarcerated. But it has to, for us it begins in terms of the community right. and our, our congregation right. has been that. And, um, but it's an ongoing work. Yeah. And there's much to be discouraged about, but there's so much to be encouraged yeah. about in terms of the activism. Yeah. Um, and we just have to keep at it. It, mm -hmm. it won't get accomplished yeah. if anybody gets tired and gets ready to throw in the tile and go to Aruba, which sounds like a great idea. The other thing I would add, too, is uh, I think a hallmark uh, for us has been the thing, the person, the situation um, that I don't understand mm -hmm. uh, or that frightens me is the one with which I must be yeah. engaged. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I didn't understand young people who were shooting each other. Um, and what the city street workers rightly challenged me to do is to say, well, look, if, uh, as I wrote one time, uh, you know, it, if the God you say you serve can't protect you on, on these streets, what use is that God to young people who have to live there all the time? And so, what does your faith actually mean in the context, in an age of fear? Yeah. Um, so I think for us, uh, and, and our experience has been, once we're clear that we're willing to do it, to our amazement, there's always um, people, partners who will help to make the introductions begin to build the bridges. The same, frankly, was true in terms of, of the police. I knew individual police officers, some of whom were members of our church. Um, but I didn't, didn't understand really the culture, didn't understand the institution, didn't understand um, the, the challenges. And I had to understand that. I mean, I had to, to go and meet and spend time with and understand people uh, who my tendency was, and particularly for me growing up in Philadelphia where the police were feared, particularly by young black yeah. men under Frank Rizzo when I grew up. Uh, um, so, so part of this is, and I think this is equally true now, the people we don't understand, the people that we fear, um, the people whose ideas, not so much the ones who maybe completely horrify us, but who really turn us off, those are the people we got to spend time with. Those are the people we got to work on getting to know. Because the, the reality is um, we're never going to completely agree. And, uh, and yet somehow we have to figure out a way to actually live in this country together yeah. and live in this neighborhood together or live in this family. As yeah. I say to people all the time, think about your family dynamics and then yeah. try to sort of you know, spread it out, right? Because there are people in your family you don't like, you know, <laughs> but, but you got to eat with them, right? You got to sit down. You got to try to talk to them. Um, so again, I, I, I would, um, I said to our congregation in the middle of the last uh, the, the presidential campaign, what has become clear to me is that there are some things that we are a absolutely going to have to resist and be clear about it and public and willing to take the consequences. But if all we offer is resistance and we're not willing to reach out, um, th then we really haven't advanced things very much. Yeah. Yeah. Dean Hemp, oh yeah, please, and then we'll come to the Dean. So as someone who has been up, up close and personal with both the Hammonds, uh, I can mm -hmm. say that this conversation is part of a long narrative mm -hmm. of loving people beyond and despite mm -hmm. what's going on with them. And then, as someone who's right now finishing up some statistics classes over at Lesley University, I can say this. It's not so much a data-driven organization. It's 
the power of data-driven prayer. So when you see all the data that Pastor Hammond gives, that data is prayed over and many different people are contributing to that data and then that data goes into a place of prayer. And that's what I've witnessed, that it is the power of data-driven prayer. You can collect it all, you can aggregate it, you can do all kinds of fancy things with it, but if you're just looking at it to kind of figure out the programming and do the thing over here and do the thing over there, you're gonna wind up in a space that's pretty interesting, but if you pray over the data, then you may see some insights that you would have never thought you would have seen. And that will change how you approach the collaborations. So mm -hmm. once again, as someone who has seen it up close and personal, mm -hmm. uh, I'm one of those people who scratches my head quite a bit when I see the kind of work that's being done. And I'm a part of that work. I'm someone who's been around in it. And every time a new thing comes up, I say this has to be the power of God working through this family and working through this congregation. Mm -hmm. And it has to be based on prayer. It has to be. Thank you very much. Dean Hampton. Uh, thanks, Ray, very much for your, your talk and for all you've done, you and uh, uh, Gloria, for uh, uh, many years. Um, my question's a little bit of a follow-up from Stephanie's, and it really comes from uh, the op-ed that was in the New York Times today, I don't know if you saw mm. it, called no. The Unmet Promise of Equality. Mm. Um, and it's, um, it's uh, the 50th anniversary today of the publication oh, of the- Kerner um, Report, yeah. Uh, the Kerner Report. Mm -hmm. And um, the op-ed is really a somewhat depressing um, um, uh, commentary on um, a number of indexes over the 50 years since the publication of that report on segregation, on, on um, uh, 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 median income, on unemployment, on incarceration, and a whole range of, 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 of graphs. Um, so it's a, it's a it's not a very encouraging tale of what has happened over those 50 years, uh, yeah. notwithstanding you know, some progress that has been made. Mm -hmm. So my question really is that you know, for an educational institution like ours and for our students you know, who um, you, you know, are, are committed to making a difference in, in the world, mm -hmm. and, um, what, what kind of advice might you give um, about where to start with, with, with this um, problem that, that uh, besets our, our nation. Um, and um, I, I realize it's a huge structural, difficult set of interrelated historical um, uh, patterns that are very difficult to change. But, but is there anything that, you know, in your lives uh, uh, um, um, uh, that you might single out as, as something that you think is really worth um, the attention of a, of a community like ours that we, we you know, for, uh, for us to um, get engaged in, get involved with, try to make a difference with? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's a, well, one of the reasons I've, I've been deeply um, excited about the, the whole uh, Sustained Peace Initiative is that I, I can't think of, in some ways, any work more important and potentially more encompassing than mm -hmm. uh, the quest for peace. Um, and of course, peace understood not just as the absence of violence, but in some sense, the presence of wholeness and justice and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and even love. Um, so uh, pursuing that, I think, is uh, one of the most uh, wonderful things you could do in terms of your And I think the institution. And so again, the, the notion of that kind of an initiative to me was really um, uh, very exciting. I think uh, the, the things I would 
say to people are, um, and this is again where an institution like this can be very helpful, to marry uh, to your great passion um, as much understanding and knowledge as you can. Yeah. Because um, often we bring a lot of passion. The Apostle Paul, I think, one point talks about it as a zeal without knowledge, right? Um, and, and some of that, I think, is the kind of uh, learning that comes from books. Um, so as I say to people all right now, the, the two books I'm really just trying to digest, uh, Hillbilly Elegy and The End of White Christian America. Mm -hmm. I really not just read it, but really kind of understand what it means. But then I've got to go beyond that kind of knowledge, which is important as a grounding, and actually spend time with people and, and cultures and learn something um, of, of how they think and they feel and what are the, th the commonalities we have and then what are the things they've gone through I have no experience of um, so that I'm, I'm not talking about problems as abstractions but I'm really seeing the human dimension of it and trying to respond as another human being to it. So again, where I think the, the schools have and can play a big role is in um, helping us to think creatively, uh, bringing people together, uh, being a place where folks across many of these barriers can really sit down and talk and try to understand. Not always agree. I don't know that we'll always get to agreement, mm -hmm. but I think we can get to a place of deeper understanding. And, and we're in a season where there are not many places where that's happening yeah. right now. It's just not happening. Please, right in the back here. Reverend Dr. Hammond, it's a pleasure to um, hear your meditation and to see Pastor Gloria as well. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, with the shift in demographics of Boston, what does uh, partnerships with 10 Point Coalition looks like within the next five to 10 years? Very good question. and. Um, you know, one of the things I think that we've talked about uh, has been, and, and, and to this point, really still haven't, I mean, we've primarily worked African-American, Afro-Caribbean communities, um, uh, have had some opportunity in, in, in a number of contexts to work with folks in the Latino community, to some extent in the Asian community, because they're similar issues that people are wrestling with there. Um, so I think that, that part of the work, that part of the bridge building is something we have to pay more time and attention to. Um, we got a little bit of it going, as I said, when we talked about this statewide safe communities, uh, because in some of the gateway cities, again, the, the, the groups that, that are there are not at all African uh, um, or African American or, or Caribbean. So, that's, I think, something we got to really, really pay more attention to that, it, and that 10 points really got to focus on. And, um, you know, our hope is as we begin to look at this issue of sort of intervention with families, if other groups find it interesting, can we work along with them? Uh, we're actually in the process of trying to figure out if we can get at least a part of the state to reorganize the way uh, it offers services. Uh, to those families because, again, most of it now is mopping up um, as opposed to really trying to, f you know, see the patterns and say, okay, how do we intervene so it's different for this generation? And that means not just working with the, the kids but working with, with uh, parents and so on. So, again, those are, I think, all of the, 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 the different areas that we've got to forge into in the next... Um, in the next five to ten years. I think we have time for one more question if anybody has one. Lauren? Thank you so much. I realize this is my second question, so if, <laughs> you want to ask, if there's another hand, I'd gladly give it up. Um, I wondered, you just used a word early in your presentation that 
um, means a lot to me, and I wondered if you'd expand on it. And you talked a little bit, or you mentioned uh, what it means to kind of lead with integrity. And I just wondered if you could say a word or two about what that meant for you all as leaders of the 10 Point um, Coalition, and kind of in particular, like what behaviors do you think were important for you guys to continue mm -hmm. to have that kind of legitimacy and integrity in a movement that's full of a lot of different opinions and, and constituencies? Yeah, um, uh, I often tell people a story of a, of a, a brilliant young drug dealer who uh, put the question of integrity to me in a way that I have never forgotten. Um, uh, th this was an amazing kid uh, who had, a uh, young man, I said kid, but I'm at that point where you know, you're old enough, everybody seems like they're young to you, but a uh, but, uh, brilliant young guy who, who, um, who would often be, f I mean, just intensely thoughtful, and, and, and then when he'd get an epiphany, he just had to talk about it then, so he called me up at midnight, and he wanted to come by and sit down and talk about this. And he said, um, this was sort of his assessment of the church. He says, I've been thinking about this for years, um, and I want to share with you. He says, you know, I'm a, I'm a drug dealer, and um, people assume that people like me don't have any moral sense or interests. He says, in fact, that's really not true. He says, I spend a lot of time thinking about what people would call, consider theological issues. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you what my read on the church to some extent is. He says, I go sit in the back of the church and, um, and I'm sitting there as somebody who likes stuff. I like gold, I like um, things, cars that, that make me feel valuable and that make me look valuable in the eyes of others. Um, I like stuff. And he says, as I sit in the church, often I see many people who seem to like stuff as much as I do. It says different stuff, but it's stuff, right? Um, he said, I love um, sex, and I love the way that it makes me feel, and I love the way people's heads turn when I have a beautiful woman on my arm. Um, and he says, but the, but the truth is, because I know who belongs where in my neighborhood, that when it comes to running women, your preachers and your trustees and your deacons could teach me things that I never knew. And then he said, as a drug dealer, the way I make myself feel better about what I know is the devastation of this community is I tell myself I'm giving people a hit so they can feel better about miserable lives. And he said, a lot of what I see going on Sunday morning is people getting a hit so they can feel better about miserable lives. His last question was, why should I be on the bottom of your hustle if I can be on the top of my own? And we had a long conversation about the way in which powerful things, including faith and church, become a hustle. Um, in all the ways that he identified in ways he didn't talk about, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, the question in, in, some many, in many respects is, is what I'm doing real or is this in any way a hustle? Mm -hmm. Would Selvin think this is a hustle, right? It, if I say um, that I'm gonna be committed, am I following through? If I say that these funds are going for this purpose, do I use them for that? Um, and frankly, I don't think it's wrong for people to hold me or the church or other faith communities to a very high standard. So um, I, I think we have to be committed to putting in the most rigorous methods of accountability. Most of our life as a church, we have always had our books audited because I don't want any, and, and our CFO, I told him when we came in, two things. Your job is to make sure if we ever go to jail, it's not for money. And, and your job is to tell us no if we're not using the money appropriately. 
So I, th I think part of it is we have to have a rigor about our own accountability. We're not above it. We, we, have, to have, we have to be even more accountability uh, because of, I think, the work to which we're called and the positions that we occupy. So for me, those are, those are the critical things. Am I relationally, do I, do I show integrity in my relationships? Do I show integrity in, in the way that I handle the resources that are entrusted to me? And those resources include the people. Do as best I can, I live out the same principles that I'm calling other people to. And I'm not gonna be perfect at it. And can I be humble enough to, when I'm not, if I'm not meeting the mark, other people have a right to call me on it. So for me, those are the critical principles. Um, and, and when you, as, as I say to police officers all the time, the same high accountability I require of myself, I acquire of you, because you, you've got a weapon. You get the right to deprive people of their liberty and their life. So you've got to walk by a much higher accountability standard. Right? And we can, we, can, we can shatter people's faith and their dreams and their hope. We've we got to be accountable. What a great question to end on. And what a, I mean, your answer and your presentation and your answers to all of these questions have given us such a rich portrait of a, a multidimensional ministry that is absolutely operating out of intersections where you've placed yourself in, in relationships and in situations where you can yourself be critiqued. And it's a, it's a challenge to all of us, no matter where we are living our vocations. Um, but this prayerful, humble, self-critical, and yet clear and, and courageous um, vocation that you're living is, is a tremendous inspiration. We really thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me.